been there. As um, bikers in Nigeria seems to be leading in different fronts. Uh, my name is Nengimote Hansen, and I am the president of Bikers in Nigeria. For the 2023 edition of our national biker safety campaign, um, we thought it wise that we should focus on ourselves as bikers. Um, the past few editions have been bikers relating with the public and trying to point the public in the right direction on how to um, communicate or relate with bikers as we commute um, on our roads daily. Um, but last year, we noticed that we had lots of newbies coming to the community, and most of them really did not understand what it means to ride and stay safe while at it. So for this year's edition, we said, you know what, let's shut out the public and let's deal with ourselves. Um, let's put our house in, in a good standing and um, make sure everybody's good. Then we can go ahead to now preach to the public on how to use our roads um, safely. So what we've done is for the whole week, starting from today, which is the 20th, running through to the 26th of March, we're going to be having these sessions, okay? And then we we're going to be having different seasoned speakers, okay? Come through, talk to us about several or various aspects that relates to our biking community or basically us riding as bikers in Nigeria, or not just in Nigeria, but different parts of the world. Um, first things first, I would say that as much as possible, this concerns every biker. So we'll need you to spread the word as much as possible to your various groups, tell your members to please log on because this is going to be very, very informative, okay? Um, one rule, basically, make sure your mics are, mics are mute, muted so that um, we can hear our facilitator properly. So for today's edition, basically, um, we're going to be talking about all gear all the time, agats, okay? And for us, we felt there was nobody best or seasoned enough to handle this session other than our very own bookie. Okay, so for all of us that know Metallic Horses, Book is the man behind Metallic Horses. So I'm just here to moderate. So I'm going to hand over to Bookie to take it up from here and then we'll run through. Um, if you have questions, you can drop it in the chat um, group and then we'll take it up afterwards. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Bookie. Um, thank you very much, um, Nengi. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for um, coming to be part of this. Um, session. Um, I'll try my best to try and make this as short and as brief as possible. I know I have 40 minutes, but my plan is to make this nothing more than 15 minutes for everyone. So I don't want anybody sleeping off for me. Right. So, um, you know, because uh, what we are trying to present is, I guess I could never cover it in totality. So what I did was I just try and, you know, compress and touch at a few bits and pieces of areas um, before, ju just so that we can all basically get the feel of what we are talking about when we, when it comes to safety. Um, safety is beyond just the gears alone. It's, it's beyond, it also basically has to do with the mind and a few other things. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, um, you know, which I have just about 10 slides for everyone. And that is what I'm going to talk through. Sorry. Just Hello? Okay, there's someone's mic on. And can we turn this is mic off, please? So um, um, I'm going to share my screen, right? So um, Damala, if you will please just um, um, help with actually, just in case we have any particular problems. Okay, so I'm about to share my screen right now. So we will start on. So I'll start over again. Um, so um, my name is Bukola Feishito. I'm one of the founding members of Metallic Horses. Um, you know, um, we've been around um, for quite some time. Oops, this is the wrong presentation. Sorry, this is not the one. Okay, and guys, I have quite a number of presentations that I present in just so that we can. Okay, all right, good. So we have the right one now. 
Hello, can you all see the slide? Can you also the slide? Yeah. Yes, we yes. can. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. So, um, well, Nengi asked me, you know, Nengi was gracious to ask me to, um, you know, talk about being always geared all the time, you know, for the um, for the biker safety initiative. So um, I did not know how much work it would take me until I sat down and I started pre preparing uh, my talking points. I had to basically significantly and shut it down. I mean, reduce it just so that we, I make the storytelling, um, you understand, engaging enough for uh, for the viewers. So thank you all also for um, choosing to be part of this. So, so this is how I'm going to run the schedule, right? We are going to, I'm going to basically do an introduction, who we are, and basically some of, um, some of you already know me and no metallic courses for the benefit of those that don't. Then um, what agat is and why do we need um, agat? Why do we need to always be geared up, geared all the time, right? Um, and we're going to be talking about one, you know, what is the purpose for why people ride? You understand why do you ride and why do you want to? That's one. And the second one is, you know, the the mind frame of the bike. I purposely put it that way instead of the frame of mind, just to just reduce the words. Um, is your head in the right place while you are trying to consider riding? Then we're just going to touch briefly on you know the right riding gears as a minimum, but not exhaustive enough. Then um, you know, I basically would say, do we really need agat at the end of the day? So this is supposed to be an interactive section. Session. However, I would just um, ask that you please just um, if you can keep your questions till the end of the end of the session. Um, maybe it would actually help us make it all very interactive and keep you all from sleeping up. Um, so a brief introduction generally. Um, well, I, I am one of the founding members of Metallic Horses. Um, the business really is owned and managed by bikers that are passionate about biking. We've been in the Nigerian market for over 18 years. And for us, this is an ongoing research, you know, into the biking community, the growth of biking, safety apparels and parts and accessories. And, how we can further grow the biking community in Nigeria, right? We have a, an established dealership network abroad, and our goal is to actually grow, um, you know, several other dealership true partners in other parts of Nigeria, and if possible, the rest of Africa, or, or starting from West Africa. Um, our, and one of our key focuses is just to one, remain aligned and integrated and connected to the biking community in Nigeria. We are here for the biking community. That is what we are all about, nothing else. So our mission really is one, you know, we are committed to fostering a safe motorcycling culture and environment by providing, you know, quality safety and style for riders across generations in terms of the apparels and accessories and the goods that we bring to you. So that is it for metallic horses in a nutshell, right? Um, so now we want to basically go into why Agat. Right? Do we do we do we need to always be geared all the time? That's the question. You understand? Why do we always, why do we need to always have riding gears? You know, what exactly is the purpose? You know, and some people probably ask, is it by force? I want to ride my bike and just not let anybody restrain me. I like the wind. You understand? You know, some people come and tell us, oh, I'm very very safe. You know, nothing can happen. I'm just going down the street. I don't need to wear a gear. You understand? Oh. You know, I'm a very, very safe rider. People say all kinds of things to sort of basically, you know, maybe justify the reason why they don't want to ride a bike. Or maybe it's just a case of where they um, have not, they place a lot more value on their motorcycles than they themselves, you understand? Whereas it really is supposed to be the reverse. So I sort of prepared two videos for why, why I got. So the first one is, this guy, the video, I got video one. I'm going to play that for you now. So that's going to play one second. Just give me a moment. Um, all right. So this is the first video. I'm trying to make this as interactive as possible. So let me know if you guys can hear the voice. Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Audio good. At this very moment, the rider is protected. 
but it only takes 0 0.03 seconds for the sneaker to burst, 0 0.6 seconds for the jeans to disintegrate. Then, like a... One second. I don't know why that happened. Okay, so let's see. At this very moment, the rider is protected, but it only takes 0 0.03 seconds for the sneaker to burst, 0 0.6 seconds for the jeans to disintegrate. Then, like a human crown, his flesh is shredded by the coarse bitumen. So that is video one, right? So now this is an example of somebody not wearing riding gears, right? I love being protected enough. He had the helmet on, but he just had a normal shoe and he had, you know, a t-shirt on and a pair of normal riding jeans, right? So now let's go to the second video. Now this second person, right? Though fully kitted, right? I'll show you this. Thursday afternoon in a 60 zone. This 34 year old motorcyclist was on his way home. It's our job to work out why he never got there. The rider broke his neck on impact here, having crashed into this car that was turning right. By analysing the impact, we know he hit the car at 30 kilometres per hour. And these marks on the road tell us that he skidded for 21 metres, having braked hard here. When he first reacted, he was doing 68. But let's change one small thing. At 60, the driver would have had more chance to see him properly. He'd have stayed in control and reached this point a moment later. The car would have cleared his path and he'd be home by now. You decide on your speed. The physics decides whether you live or die. All right, thank you for... Let me escape this guy. So, so I'll go back into the, to the slide now. Give me a second. Escape. Um, so I go back to the slide. So now um, the first video shows us a guy that one's not fully kitted, right? He underestimated the importance. Whereas the other video generally has more to do with the mind of the rider himself. He was definitely fully kitted and still basically he didn't make it. Um, he, didn't, he didn't make it through that accident. He simply just says one thing. The fact that you're fully geared is not a really a guarantee of safety of your life. You understand? If your mind is not in the right place, that's one. Two, um, and I'm going to, okay, fine. I mean, we all go into riding for several different reasons, right? You know, why do you want to ride generally? Or why do you ride or why do you want to ride? Some people ride for commute, come rain or, or, or sunshine, they ride. Some people ride to basically save time. Some people ride basically just for leisure. Some of us basically ride for just to show, just to show how, nice we look or how beautiful our bike is and all that sort of thing which is all well and fine you understand some of us it basically helps us to relax some of us is, is retirement for some of us really it's just to enjoy the gathering and camaraderie of other bikers some of us really is for for sports right whatever the reason is really it does it shouldn't underplay the importance of us really having the right gear at the right time because they vary across all spectrum, right? Now, although I've not gotten to the gear part, I'm just trying to emphasize more on the part that really it's much more important. And it, the biker is much more important than everything else. So now moving on to what we call um, a rider's mind frames. You know, before you basically step out to ride, or even before you decide that you want to, to really go and ride, or even if you, Decide that, okay, fine, you know, I want to ride. You, you want to ask yourself, you know, is your head in the right place? You know, what is much more important, you know, when you're about to ride? Is it the motorcycle or you? You understand? Um, did you learn how to ride properly? Did you learn from the right instructors? Did you learn how to, you know, did you learn by basically starting on, you know, picking on the right habits when you are going to ride? You understand? You know, I basically, are your riding habits healthy? Because if you have good riding habits, right, it transcends onto the next rider and they sort of basically will pick that those good riding habits from you. But if you have bad riding habits, generally, 
I mean, that also basically could just be passed on to other riders. And the truth about it is we, um, we have several different generations. There are generations before me, gen my own generation, generations after me and the generations after the ones after me and the ones that are gonna be coming on before them, after us, you know? Um, you know, when you say you want to ride, okay, fine. You're saying you want to ride because it makes you feel free or you want to fly, you understand? Are you riding high or intoxicated? You understand how does that affect your mind? How does that affect your, your decision making as you as you ride? Or when you want to get out to go and ride, is, did your wife just vex you? I say, man, forget this woman, man. I'm getting on my bike and I'm taking off. You understand? Is that <laughs> you know you want to check your frame of mind because I know a guy that sort of basically after just having an argument with his with his wife, he basically climbs on his bike and basically just heads on the road basically and suddenly he came back home without the bike. You know, I did not say <laughs> what happened. Right? Can you all still hear me? Or um, so also basically, are you getting onto the bike angry? That's one. Yes. Two. I, you know, are you when you get on the road, right? Um, you know, when other road users are basically, uh, you know, bugging you, they are in their cages, and you are in your bike that is exposed. You know, do you think you really should be in a frame of mind to be getting angry at other road users? Are you stressed? Is it basically to actually help bring down your stress and? Is your stress level at the point where you know that if I go out riding, it would help bring it down or it might help raise it up, you know? Or do you have the mentality that, oh, now me get road. So I have rights over the road, over the next person in the car that is a cage, right? Or, you know, are you one of those bikers that, you know, as you climb on your bike, you know, I want to finish the speedometer to the end. Let me see where the speedometer is getting. You understand all of this, right? Now, while I'm saying basically is your is your mind is your is your is your mind frame in the right place, it helps you also part of it also helps you decide whether you are going to be that foolish biker, right? That you know there are extremes that decides to actually go out in a fool's gear, right? Like we saw in the other guy, in the first video, or the guy that's also basically you know stand fully geared and is basically you know increases safety bubble to a certain extent. Whereas generally, at least you've taken care of that and the mind becomes um, the next one, right? So th that's that one, you know, where's your, where's your frame of mind? You know, when, you know, what, what's the reason behind what you are doing? And as you're going into writing, you know, where's the value? Is the value me or is the value my motorcycle? Is my five million motorcycle much, much more value, much more valuable than me that I'm actually getting on the motorcycle? These are the questions I want us to basically be, it is worth us asking ourselves, right? And it helps us basically make a decision that enables us to be safer as we practice, uh, go about our daily riding chores. Now, so the next one is basically riding gears, right? Now, um, what I have on this slide basically is not exhaustive enough. So what, I, what we just did here was say, okay, fine. There is a minimum set of gears that bikers need to have. You understand when we talk about gears, and that is one: it's the helmet, right? It's the jacket, it's the riding glove, it's the riding boots, and basically the riding pants. And I'm going to touch a little bit on them because this is the main reason why um, we are having this presentation. So, for example, for helmets now, you know we have what we call a full face helmet. And a modular helmet. Now, I, I did not say, but for those that don't use helmets, or um, it would just basically be, you know, foolish, right? And I, I, I don't miss words here for anyone to say that they want to one ride without a helmet. That's one as a minimum, right? And we sort of reduced the um, helmet choices here to full face and modular because um, the full face helmet one offers the highest form of protection because there are no joints around them. In, in addition to that, basically, we have what we call also the modular helmets, where those are the ones that you can pretty much on, open on the front or sort of basically revolve around, depending on the design of the helmet. But what is most important is that whatever helmet that you're going to get, make sure it has the right, should I say, e, um, safety rating on it. There's what we call the DOT, which is Department of Transportation, which is um, a safety rating for the US and basically the ECER which is a safety rating for Europe, right? Now, there are other safety ratings as well, called the Sharp, the Snell, it, it just goes on and on. But the thing there is one, 
for a helmet, really, starting really, you want to have a full face helmet. If you feel too claustrophobic and all that, you get yourself a high quality modular helmet. Now, depending on the bike that you ride as well, some people use what they call a half face helmet, a, um, a helmet that's like a cap. I don't like to call it a helmet, I call it a cap. You know, um, you know it, it's just sort of basically, there's a wide range that is out there that I can't, you know, for lack of time, I have to basically move on to the next one. Then we also have what we call riding jackets. Now, um, the riding jackets basically could be leather or could be mesh. Now, leather offers the highest form of protection when, I come, when it comes to one abrasion. But if you're basically going to be getting any leather jacket as well, you want to make sure that the leather jackets have the knee pad protection, which are basically, the knee, uh, sorry, has the elbow pads in them and they have the back protector. Some people, when they wear um, jackets, generally, they want to have an extra body armor on the inside to get just that extra level of protection. But most jackets really come with a back protector and an elbow protector. Then we call the riding gloves, right? We, those ones also come in mesh and lead, full leather. Some of them have extra knuckles for protection. Some of them don't. They are also mesh leather and they could be short or they could be long. The long gloves gives you an extra calf protection um, on your hand, right? As basically the shorter ones basically, uh, you know, they don't give you that extra protection beyond the, should I say the, is it the, the wrist? Yes, exactly. Then we also have what we call um, the riding boots. We have the long riding boots, which basically gives you protection through past your shin area. And we have the short riding, um, riding boots, right? Um, and, and this also basically varies. There are, there are several different designs out there right now, but um, for lack of time, I can't really show um, all the varieties. We will never finish even just on one particular product. Then, we're now going down to the to the riding pants. You know, we also have the leather and we have the mesh. I've talked about the, you know, the benefits of leather over mesh. However, you understand a lot of the mesh that we have today, general, a lot of the mesh that we have today, uh, there's a lot of technology in them that has actually improved the quality and the protection capabilities of those pants. You know, so um, because we are on this side of the continent, which is basically Nigeria, West Africa, it's summer all year round. A lot of times people prefer to actually have mesh worn instead of leather. What, you, what is most important is that for every riding gear that you are going to be putting on, if it's the jackets and the pants, make sure that they all have the right um, protective padding that meets the right CE level, always included in the pants and in the jacket. You know, make sure your boots are also of the right quality. At least boots are designed to hold your leg in place. They are not designed to you don't want your boots falling off when you just have a small unscheduled stop and dismount. You understand? And your helmets are basically just of the of the right quality. So that that is just that. But aside all these products, we have what we call um, you understand? I've mentioned the body armor. We have what we call knee pads. There are rain suits. There are several other you know riding apparels and accessories that complement these five basic riding um, gear. I would say. Uh, a basic minimum for every rider, right? So, um, you know, not after going on from here, and I'll basically now come back and ask you this question, you know, do we really need to be always geared all the time? You know, in my own view, really, I mean, can anybody, I mean, is there anybody that says, that think we don't really need to? Do you all agree that we need to be geared all the time when we ride? Yes, we agree. With. You know, so the whole idea, apart from us, no contest. apart from our personal protection, there's a lot much more at stake, you understand, in my view, for the biking community. One, right, being a GAT always is a great step towards better riding habits. One, for us and for the people that see us, that watch us, you understand. Everybody that sees an old biker, to be honest, whether we look at it or not, We've inspired another biker. We are an inspiration. The biking community, we are inspiring more people to get into biking. And don't, I, I would not miss what basically the biking community is growing at such a rate that, you know, it's hard to actually comprehend today. And really, why do we always need to be a guard? It increases our chances of being able to ride another day. If you fall on a bike and you get up, you know that basically you can easily, you know, 
you are in one piece. You can always write another time. It helps us also to protect the image and the reputation of the biking community. We are doctors, we are lawyers, we are businessmen. You understand? We do not want to be seen as one riffraffs, money miss road, um, the guy that's chasing the next thing in pants and all that. You know, and apart from that, again, being geared is super cool. You understand? It's cool, it's admirable. When people see, I mean, a lot of you also, I know, I mean, I get, I, we get exposed to a lot of bikers generally. I mean, and we've, we've gotten the opportunity to have seen several different bikers. And we know that people ride for a myriad of different reasons. You understand? However, a biker today inspires the biker of the next generation. I know generally that I was actually inspired by bikers. You understand? When I, before I got into riding myself, you know, and, you know, just re reiterate again, it helps us also pass a good riding habit, you understand, H riding habit message to the next generation. I can tell you guys, you know, because I'm into research as well, our riding habits in Nigeria, right, our riding habits in Nigeria is a lot better than a lot of, she likes to basically riding communities, riding habits in other parts of the world. I would say basically some parts of the US and some parts of the UK. And I think that, and that we owe that in part really to, to should I say basically the riding schools, the everybody that is the riding clubs, everybody that is actually contributing towards a safe biking environment. You understand? So now the reason why we want to be aghast all the time is simply just because we want to be able to. The last video, just one second. I hope you guys like this one. Uh, Microsoft PowerPoint has stopped working. Okay, um, I have Okay, one second. Um, okay, so while we wait for that, um, do not forget to drop your questions in the chat forum. Uh, more questions will be attended to at the end of the session. Thank you. Yeah, um, one second. Then yeah, let me bring up play. All right. Um, this is the wrong one. Now, everyone, this is an extreme case, I know, right? right. However, um, the goal is to have this buttress um, the point for Agat. Coffee. Um, Nengi, how, how much time? Sorry? How, how much am time? I doing in time? Yeah, you're doing, you're doing pretty fine. Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can do a transfer, no wala. All right, so guys, um, so, uh, yeah. so, so I'm actually showing you an accident by that's been had by Mark Marquez, right? There's a point I want to actually buttress here. We all know any in MotoGP, he's going to be fully, he's fully kitted, fully geared. That accident is pretty severe, right? But watch what happens at the end of the day. As you can see, he got up, right? And he's right, he got up basically, and he's basically running all the way to go and get the second motorcycle and to go back and resume the race, right? And he runs, he runs in, pretty exhausted, same gear, everything. And he picks up the bike and he goes back on riding, right? Now, in my own view, right, this would not be possible. One second. Would never have been possible if, and I'll react to it again, if, um, one second, if he did not have the right gears on, if he wasn't geared, he would not be able to. Um, have gotten off from that accident 
and basically gotten and just run all the way. I mean, he still had the energy, you understand? And, you know, I, I don't know whether it's adrenaline or anything like that, but he went back and he picked up the next bike and he goes back onto the, onto, onto the peak and continues riding. Um, I'm putting this back on now, okay? And goes back and continues riding, right? While it's nice to have a nice looking gear that is cool and all that, the whole like, let's not take away the importance of these things that we put on our bodies because this is actually the steps that we take to ensure that whatever happens, you understand, we, the primary, um, the primary focus are always one protected to the fullest level because bones, right, are hard to replace. Bones are hard to fix. Motorcycles, it doesn't matter whatever happens to them, they can always be replaced. A part can be, a fairing can be replaced or even if a bike is totally condemned, it, it can easily be replaced. But a broken bone, a broken skull, a, a concussion takes a lot more time to actually recover from, right? So um, without much ado, um, they are all, um, thank you all very much you know, for um, listening through this. Um, the goal is not to make this um, exhaustive. I'm just keeping it brief. Um, and if, thank you all for listening. And if you all have any questions, um, I'm open to take. Um, I am not the epitome of all wisdom when it comes to biking gears and accessories. I bet a lot of bikers also probably would know a lot about some of these gears more than I do, even though I've been doing it for like 18 years. But um, I always basically also um, choose to, um, there's always something new to learn every day. But if you have any questions, um, please ask. And thank you all very much for um, coming to be part of this first session of the BSI initiative. And thank you all very much, the BSI team for organizing this. Um, thank you all also for being gracious to at least come and listen to me and I hope I've um, not bored you guys and um, and I hope you guys have been able to are able to take something from from this very brief um, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Boki. Um, I would like to add that um, this whole program was brought to us by being bikers in Nigeria in yes. collaboration Thank with you, BSI Bain. and SCAN. Um, thank you, I, Scott, thank show, you, I think a couple of questions have come through. Um, yeah. okay, I don't know if you can go through them. Okay, so uh, there's, me... there's a comment on um, expiration dates and life, life limits on gears. Ha. Ah. Okay. All right. So what we've seen is this, right? Um, you know, when it talks, when it talk, when it comes to gears, right? If you keep everything under the proper temperature and pressure, and you keep it consistent, I, ideally, right? You, your gear should actually be able to serve you. But the moment you take your gear out, and you expose it to sun, heat, and rain, if you don't um, keep it in a proper place, generally, it will deteriorate faster. That's one. Two, it's fabric. It's like clothes, right? After some time, it would deteriorate. When it comes to really a time limit, to be honest, I, I can't really put a time limit on the gear, really, because is it leather we are talking about? Is it mesh we are talking about? Is it use on the road we are talking about? Um, it, it's all subject to one, how you use it, how you keep it. Um, for us in the showroom, we try and make sure that the gear sort of lasts as long as possible. That's why um, that is a metallic, that's why we sort of basically burn power and have it all ac all the time to make them last for as long. And um, primarily also because we don't want to lose money, you know, and we want to actually make sure that the, the gears are there, you know, for people. And, and just to make sure that the gears are actually available for you. So putting a time limit on riding gears, it, it, it's going to be hard. So for example, we have some helmets have a five year um, lifespan. Now, there's a question with that where they say, okay, if you use the, is it from the time of use or from the time of storage? Sometimes a lot of the manufacturers are quite unclear about that. So what we, what I would basically advise is that whatever gear it is that you use, right? Ideally, and because we are in Nigeria and it is summer all year round, 
a lot of times your gears will sort of, within one year, would actually deteriorate if you use it regularly, let's say pretty much really every weekend, sort of, you know? And, and the thing there is that, you know, it, it's, um, if it comes to tires, right? Um, although tires basically a product for your motorcycle, it's not the riding gear, right? And there's this argument of it basically being a three-year lifespan or a five-year lifespan. Some people say, okay, fine, it can be a 10-year lifespan as long as you store it under the same temperature and pressure and it doesn't deteriorate. The only time it deteriorates is if you pack it out and it gets affected by weathering, weathering sun, heat, rain, and that sort of basically affects the uh, composition of the product. In, in the case of where that is not the case, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, I, I wouldn't have a right um, answer because of the variation of products, but the advice I can actually give is that just take care of your gears very well. That's one. When you get home, don't just dump it in a the corner. Then you call maybe like three months later and say, ah, I just bought this thing like two months ago. The thing has already started sharing. You understand? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you know, and you come and make us, force us to actually basically give you a major discount on the next product that you want to get because they're trying to please you. You understand? You know, it's a two-way thing. You understand? Help us to actually stay in business by taking care of your products, you understand? However, um, on a more serious note, um, I would say really um, ju just take care of your gear properly, you know? However, it it's the same, think of it like they are, they are clothes, they are riding clothes. It's just that they have an extra level of protection on them. So at some point in time, you will have to replace them, you know? Um, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but that is the advice I can actually give on that. Um, okay. I hope Perfect. that can, that yeah, would that, suffice. That works. Yeah, that works, I think. That works. Okay. okay so um, there's another question. Um, okay. Um, it states, when should a helmet be changed? Well, um, somebody has responded to that question, but I think um, you should throw more light on it. <sighs> okay. When should it? I'm not, I'm not looking at the questions, though, but um, no, I'll read, I read out to you. I'll read out to you. Yeah. So where should yeah. your helmet be changed? That's one. One, um, your helmet has a lifespan. There's always a there's always a warranty period on the helmet. That is one. Two, if you crash the, if you crash with your helmet, it definitely changes. Now, a helmet has three parts to it, right? There's the outer layer, which is the polycarbonate layer, it could be the carbon fiber layer, or it could be the um I've forgotten the um the name of the, um, the other part. Then there's an the inner polystyrene layer, right? Which is the one that takes majority of the shock from the inside. And there's also the inner padding. Now, if you drop your helmet or you fall with your helmet, the truth about it is, um, you know, depending on severity of the helmet, really, you would really, if you think the helmet still looks fine, normally, if, it, if you are abroad, they'll tell you to bring the helmet and they'll come and help you test the integrity of the helmet. But here in Nigeria, we don't have an integrity test system, right? So what I normally just tell people is to be on the safe side, right? If you drop your helmet or you crash with your helmet, replace it because come to think about it really, okay, fine. If you are wearing a compromised helmet and if you also, if you are selling a bike, right? If you have crashed with your helmet, please don't hand over your old helmet to the next biker. It could be the wrong size helmet, right? That's one. And two, it could be a compromised helmet already, but the other biker that could be a new biker would not really know. So the thing there is, um, very good quality helmets will serve you the long term. I have a showy helmet that I use that has served me for approximately, I've, I've been using it for about six years now. However, I mean, I, I'm, I normally like to just basically take care of my, I like to use, get value out of my products. You understand that I use. So, well, that would actually vary for, it, 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 could, it could differ for, for other people, you know? But what I would say really is that one, if it's a good helmet, if you, if you spend a significant amount of money in investing in a, in a good helmet, it should serve you for a good period. But if you crash with that helmet, really, you don't want to be wearing the helmet back again because, I mean, I mean what's the point? Are you saying that generally that the helmet is now of much more value than the head that which are wearing it in wearing it on in the first place, really. So, however, 
um, some manufacturers have a three-year warranty, some have a five-year warranty. The five-year warranty is the maximum I've seen, and that has been with Shoei or, or Arai helmets. But we have people that have um, used helmets um, for, for longer, right? So um, that, that, that is um, part, of my response to, part of my response to that question. It's not exhaustive, okay. but yeah. I'm just sharing part of my experience. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, Buki, for that. Um, so, if you have more questions, um, just raise your hand. Um, Simola is going to unmute you, and then so that you can ask your questions directly. So, I can see Tubi's hands up. I can see El uh, Buki's hand up. Simola, over to you. Okay. Okay, so I think we'll go with them um, Tubi. Okay. Uh, Buki, good evening. This is Queen. Happy Hi, Julie. Hi. Again. How are you? Um, there's Fine. something I want to find out. Um, yes. Aside from the helmet, any other gear you get, you know, like tires where you actually can look at expiry mm -hmm. date or date of manufacture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is there anything one can look out for when you're buying uh, any gear? Because like um, I have a, what you call it, uh, a Danish talk. And mm -hmm. uh, aside from the fact that I use it every day, um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether the thing has reached uh, time for me to change or add. And uh, I'm just wondering, is there anything one can look at like tires that guide you on the body, maybe label? On the body, maybe label. Um, to be honest, in all the years that I've actually done um, gears. What I've, the, the thing there is that as long as the, um, the, um, the pockets for the pads are, are still in place, you can easily always just replace the protective pads, which is basically the back protector and the elbow protector and the shoulder protector, because those are the ones that I know to actually quite deteriorate, provided that your leathers are still intact. You should just be able to replace the protective paddings in them because those I know get to a point where they start to basically just crack out and then they just, you know, they lose, lose, lose their um, purpose. But if your, if your leather or your riding gear is still in one piece, you know, I mean, I would love to sell you a new one, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be using your old one if you can save yourself a bit of box by basically getting the paddings that would actually help you use the, um, the gear for longer. However, also, there's also, I mean, like I said, it depends on, you know, I mean, the, your purpose for wanting to have that gear in the first case, yeah, in the first place, really. Um, some people like to basically collect, but if, you, if it's you that you're trying to just get, you know, extreme value from your gear, then just replace the paddings. As long as you examine the apparel and see that there are no loose, um, should I say, seams and all that sort of, it doesn't rip out and all that. I mean, it's fine. A lot of these premium products, Dainisi, Alpine Stars, RSTs, they pretty much build their, their products to actually last a significant period of, of time, you know? So that's, that's really what I can really say. But in terms of any information on it, um, on the, on, on the apparels themselves, I would expect that after you've used it for a significant period and washing and cleaning, all the, all the writings on the labels would have sort of washed off. You know what I mean? So what you can really just check for is the pockets that hold the protective paddings and make sure that they are all still in place. But if the pockets are compromised, then um, the stuff has done its job for you. And um, it's time to basically get a replacement at that point. I don't know if I was able to answer Queen. Yeah, yes, you've tried. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank sir, you. you're not, I'm not satisfied. Sorry for jumping in. She mentioned tires. Tires, no, no, okay, no, no. She said aside from tires, the question was not about tires. The question was about riding gear. He said like tires for gears, what can one look for? So okay, sir, that is the, the assumption that she's saying that I know what to look for on tires in terms of expiry date or manufacture date or 
rules on tires. Or do you want to talk about tires, which is out of the scope of this presentation, though? But I can speak on it if you want me to. My bad, sir. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, El Boogie, you're on. And after that, um, Abiola will take over. El Boogie, please unmute yourself, please. Yes. Uh, hi. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Hi, Buki. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hi. Nice uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Yes. So I wanted well, to ask. Well. Um, oh, absolutely. So um, speaking about maintenance of yes. gear, especially okay. with uh, um, uh, jackets, pants, gloves, okay. what is the best cleaning method and products for mesh and leather, leather okay. cares. If, if, if that is, if they are not, if the methods or products are not the same, what would be best for mesh? What would okay. be best for leather in terms of method of cleaning yes. and products as well? Plus, yes. is detergent advisable? Is washing machine use advisable? Is hanging mm -hmm. to dry under the sunlight advisable? I mean, these are some mm -hmm. concerns that I have of had over time. I do okay. use leather cleaning uh, products, but I wonder sometimes, cause I mean, I wonder if I'm, I'm a daily rider. I ride like nine days a week, <laughs> if wow. that's possible. You know, so you can yeah. imagine the dust, the sunlight and all whatnot. Yeah. And some keeping up with um, these cleaning products can be, sometimes they're not available. Sometimes it's, it, it can run into uh, high costs over yes. time. You know, so I do so, wonder what would, yeah. is there, is, are there alternatives? Okay, That's, so uh, so, so so now um, this is what I've experienced over time, right? Apart from the fact that when you get in front of the when you get the gear, the labels will say the kind of washing that is appropriate for that um, particular product. Now, if it's leather, right? Um, there's the alternative of actually using what they call the leather care products to actually clean the leather. But for okay. someone that rides every day, like yourself, nine days a week, like you said. Um, I, if I'm going to assume that you, are, you wear letters every day, if you wear letters every day, then what's going to happen is that one, you have two things you're going to be battling with, right? One, with the leather, you'll be sweating a lot. So basically the sweat yep. percolates on the inside of the leather, right? Which makes your, the inner fabric of leather sort of smell, right? And then you're also going to be dealing with the outer part of the, um, the, the leather jacket where it gets dirty, which you can easily use. If you that's basically a leather care product to clean. Right. What I've done with some of my leather products in the past is that because of the fact that I sweat in leathers, right? So what I do is when I take it off and I decide I'm not going to really wear it, I never, I never machine wash my leather gears. Okay. I never um, heat dry it. I just never heat dry it generally. So a lot of times what I normally do is that I just basically take my leather gear, you know, put, um, get to what we call the mild the detergent or mild soap generally. And what I do is that um, I soak, I just sort of basically dip the, should I say basically the letters in the water, sort of basically shake it, you understand? Mm -hmm. you no, know, for a very short period because some dyed letters could run. So you oh. don't want to keep it in the, in the soap or the detergent up to the point where the dye of the letter starts to run on other parts of the letter. So I just sort of basically do that generally and basically just sort of bring it out and sort of dry it out and hang it out to basically dry under normal temperature. So that is me personally assuming that I'm doing this under the a consistent, should I say basically um, uh, atmospheric, should I say basically conditions or something. Okay. Because I'm assuming that, okay, if I was right and it starts to rain, you understand, um, the way my letters will actually get affected, it can't be worse than, you know, if I just did a quick, you know, um, you know, deep into the water and shake it, shake it, shake it. I use my hand to sort of basically rub it on the inside. Hopefully that takes off the dirt and I just sort of don't keep it in the water, soap water too long and, and I rinse it and I basically sort of dry it out. That's one. Um, that is one for, for, for leather, right? Um, but I guess you don't want to do that too often with leathers. You understand? Because over time as well, generally, dipping um, your leathers into water consistently and letting it dry out could shrink out, could shrink the leather up to the point where you might not even exactly like the look anymore. That is for 
Should I say basically let out ferrules? Now for mesh, right? A lot of them really, you can easily use the same method, but first and foremost, you have to take out the padding for the elbow and the shoulder and the back, take them out, right? And you can do that same, you understand, washing, I mean, sort of basically running it through because I'm assuming that a lot of the mesh jackets that we have nowadays, apart from the ones that are fabric cutting, the ones that are polyamide, those ones that are wire mesh and all that, those ones you can easily just sort of use the same amount of washing. Some of them you could throw it in the washing machine and dry it out because it's actually mesh. I never um, heat dry any of my riding gears. Um, it's not like some of them don't, some of the instructions on the labels doesn't say that you can, doesn't say you can't do that. I just, as a matter of practice, I don't. So that's why um, I sort of basically, I get my products to sort of last a lot longer for me that way. You understand? So um, that is one for, you know, leathers against mesh. What I'm saying is also not exhaustive. I don't know, some bikers might be able to share some of their experiences as well in terms of um, getting their gears to last a lot longer. I have had, I have, um, riding boots and riding gears I've had for almost 10 years, really, and they still sort of basically serve me, really. Um, but I, I think that more has to also do with the quality of the products that I sort of basically... And, and the miles you might have on it as well. Yes, exactly. Sure. You know, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to cut in to this now because we have um, less than four minutes to go so that we carry everybody along. Oh, um, okay. okay. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll ask Abiola to unmute yourself and then Go Hope I was able to answer your questions. So did that at least uh, try absolutely. to address your question? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, thanks uh, for the very informative uh, lecture. Um, and um, I also um, have a question which um, might sound, uh, apologies if it sounds a little bit um, a pedestrian, but- um, No, there's no I, question that is too, please <laughs> just shoot. Right. Okay. Um, I've uh, actually initially started uh, when I started riding many years back. I uh, used to wear leather and so on. But when I came back to Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. I tried wearing my leathers and I just could not stand the heat and how everything worked. So eventually okay. I kind of um, slipped into not wearing leathers um, in Nigeria. Um, okay. But what I also um, came across was this information about um, Gore-Tex, some jackets that are, they, when you look at them, they look like ordinary jackets, like maybe jeans jackets and so on, but they're made mm -hmm. of a material called Gore-Tex. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but yes, I'm not I am, able yes. to um, come across anybody that um, sells them um, because they would be a kind of alternative to wearing leathers, wouldn't they? Okay, now, um, hi. Okay, so, um, there's a way manufacturers have talked about. I'm, so, so in my own view, generally, Gore-Tex are pretty much, um, I would say, they, they are, even though they are, they are, they are, they are a solid material, they are, they are not exactly as comfortable as really wearing, um, it might be the, oh boy, what's the word? Um, just give me a second. Um, for a lot of riding gears, we have dry star and we have Gore-Tex, right? Then we also have the ones that are air, right? So a lot of the Gore-Tex are sort of really waterproof from what I sort of basically understand, right? And um, in my own view, since you are wearing leathers before, I, I, am I okay to say, to assume that you are wearing this abroad? That was that was when I was in the UK. That was when you were in the UK. So now, what is happening is that um, in the UK, right, there are certain gears that are suited for those places. Now, in Nigeria, it's not like you can't actually wear leathers here, but it's just that you have to have the right kind of leather. Is it the perforated leather or is it the leather that has both leather and mesh in it integrated, generally? So one of the things, the research that we have actually carried out in determining the kind of products that we bring into Nigeria is that to make sure that the products that we bring in are suited for people riding within the Nigerian or the West African environment because it is summer all year round here. 
in the UK generally, there are periods in time where it gets significantly really cold. You understand? So, and the way, I mean, you don't really have sun for a very long time. So it's okay for you to be fully wearing leathers all the time because the weather sort of basically permits it. Whereas if you are here, those same kind of leather gears, you understand? There has to be a bit of modification to them for it to actually work here. Hence the reason why you need what we call, should I say one, perforated leathers here. Now, Gore-Tex, um, um, I'm probably going to have to go and study about this again, but for some reason, the only boots, the only thing I do in Gore-Tex a lot of times, I usually ride in boots. Um, from what I understand generally, Gore-Tex are usually sort of more waterproof than, than air, right? And however, um, I don't think I know enough about it to really speak about it, but now that you've Ask that question is a very, very good one. And I will try and read up on it a little bit more, right? I just never, um, a while back when I sort of basically, when we researched and bringing them in, we just thought they were not, um, you know, the right, uh, should I say basically, um, product for the, should I say basically, would be riding conditions in Nigeria here. You know, I mean, and since we already have a replacement in terms of basically, um, jackets that are leather and mesh and leather perforated, you know, why bother our head with basically doing Gore-Tex when we can simply just do air jackets and um, mesh, you know? So what I understand, you know, and this might, this terminology might have changed, but if Gore-Tex is what I think it is, which is supposed to be waterproof, then um, you would significantly sweat in it like you would sweat in, in leathers. However, if there's anyone that has, um, you know, that has a different opinion um, about Gore-Tex products, and um, please do share. So I, 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 I well. think um, yeah, I think there are a couple of responses already in the chat group. Um, Ian, so that is that is ongoing while you. Okay, what did Yang say? I'd like to hear, please. Um, hold on, hold on. Um, please read. So hey, he talked about was explaining. So I think he just explained that what Cortex was it's supposed to be um, waterproof, but allow air in. Okay. Okay, I can see what he wrote. He said, Gore-Tex will retain heat in the heat of Nigeria, except yeah. you can use them, but do not accept, uh, do not expect comfort. Do not expect comfort. So, Ian, that means you are saying it's basically close to, closer to leather than, closer, closer to leather than an air or mesh airflow jacket, right? Yes, because uh, they are actually made for temperate and cool regions. They will work here, but if you are riding in the town, you are going to sweat. I think that's the summary because of the short time we have. If you are doing a long trip where you spend little time in tick traffic, yes, they work because Gore-Tex basically is a solution for you not to carry an extra layer of waterproof. So you wear the same thing, whether it's raining or not. But like most things, you have to remember that most gear were not designed for our climate where we have rain and heat at the same time. For most yes. people that design gear, you have to remember that for them, rain means cold. But rain here does not mean cold. It just means it's raining. And then you are still very humid and still very hot. So I use a couple of Gore-Tex gear when I was riding and when I do very long trips. But it's not something I will say use inside the town. But I mean, it's your decision if waterproofing is more important than your not being um, not overheating, which will lead to other problems. Thanks. OK, thank you, waterproof. Thank you, Ian. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. So we're going to take a last question because um, we have um, a short amount of time. Um, so Ahmed, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Good I'm evening. I'm going to stop sharing because I want uh, to see everybody's face. Are you there? Okay. Good evening, Buki. Hi. Hi, thank you for the informative session. Okay, my name is Abdul, yeah, and I'm a new writer. And I just want to use this opportunity to say thank you, Buki. Welcome to the community, Abdul. 
I remember when I was trying to get my, my helmet, I had a problem with sizing, you know, and you trusted me enough to send me like three different helmets. Meanwhile, I paid for just one. You know, when we found the one that fitted, then we returned the other ones to you in Lagos. Thank you. That was very good. Thank you, too. Yeah. So um, I, I, I sent in an order for uh, the mesh jackets recently and pants, too. But, I mean, we're talking about safety, you know, and um, how important it is for us to gear up properly. But what I reckon is that these things are very pricey, you know. So I threw in a question earlier about what you can do to help us <laughs> to help us reduce that cost effect of it in any way possible you know i don't know there has to be something you can do for us okay because me i, I like to get proper gears every time you understand but well, these things are actually exp i understand riding is like an expensive sport or expensive hobby or whatever but still where is your president you understand uh so Whatever you can do for us, we'll be very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Booker. Where is you don't, president? You don't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's it. What can you do for us on pricing? Oh, um, so guys, um, okay, so so for us, okay, so for me, right, until the, the goal is not to make this thing expensive. The goal is to ensure that we um, make sure that the biking community develops a safety habit um the goal for us really is to ensure that no matter what you're able to actually get these things um yes we want to make a profit and um, yes we are in a business to um you know we're in the business to make a profit and we would like to actually do that but um our game is a long-term game and for us we we have chosen you know where we want to be do we want to be on the side of quality or we want to be on the side of cheap products. To be honest, um, it's easy for us. We can easily do cheaper products and, um, and we'll sell them to you. But for us, as a matter of principle, it's, it's not a, for us, it's, it's not about the money. It's, it's, about, it's, about the, it's about the rider themselves. You know, I like the fact that when I hear that, okay, somebody dropped his bike and it fell down and the person got up back, and it was in one piece. We tell ourselves our metallic horses that we have saved a life or we have saved an injury. You understand? It, the, the reason is because the premium for us really is on you, not even the gear itself. Um, if you sort of, we've tried several different ways to ensure that one, um, the prices are not expensive. We won't go to the point where we sort of match our prices with um, the prices that you find online generally. So um but quality comes at a cost right and you would have to be the one to decide you know whether you are worth that whether you're worth treating yourself to that quality or you could decide that okay you know what i mean this is not going to basically work for us but we always try and work with people on their price points and all that sort of thing you know and i like the fact that you said that you know we sent you three helmets right you know on trust we've not met we've never really seen per se Oh, absolutely. And, and, and so it, that is just basically to show you that really for us, uh, you are much more important. We want you to have that gear and we want you to actually have the right gear, you understand, rather than, um, you know, just any kind of gear. Because that way, really, the, what you said about us, which I'm actually happy about, and thank you for being gracious to actually share this with us. Um, you know, it's, it's what you do to pass on to the next person. And I'm very sure that we try to work up, work with you on price. I'm very sure. Veronica takes care of everybody. I'm very, very sure. That, that's Veronica, the Veronica that did not give me any, any discount. So what she gave me was free balaclava. Uh, that was what she gave me. But it, was, it, was, it, it came in very handy. Thank you very much. You know, that Thank is you. something as well. But we'll, of course we'll always try and work with you <laughs> as well. <laughs> you know, but but whatever it is will be, we 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 always try and basically work with everyone, really. You know, because the reason why we have these guests is we want to sell them, we don't want to stock them. You understand? And that's why we do the regular sales and all that sort of thing, just so that I mean we don't want the guests in the showroom, we want you to have them. So that's the main reason why we bought them in the first place, you know. But but we keep on trying our best for you, you know. Thank what you, I mean? that, that's why Thank we are you. here. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too, as well. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you me, much. I know how much I spent in your shop. You never give me free balaclava. Ah, thank you very much. You're very gracious. I will note that down. This is from Mr. Leia Giri, right? That's the voice. Yes, sir, uh, you are correct. Uh -huh. Look, if you are noting it down, maybe you should note my name down too, Tilewa. You know, say I'll be a customer. <laughs> you are know, just a problem. You are just a problem child. Please, Tilewa, don't please. come and do a catch here. Oh. Stay your uh, lane. No, if, no, Buki, Buki, if not say, if not by that one. Stay uh, your lane, Tilewa, stay your lane. Okay. Okay, okay play. I don't do my name. Add my can name. Can I ask you a question, please? Okay, thank you, thank you, guys. Can I ask you a question? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yes, Kutiba has a question, please. Thank you, guys. Um, we have we have limited time. I think we've overshot our time already. Kutiba, um, can I ask you a question quickly, please? Uh, Eddie. Okay, so I think for more questions, for more questions, um, it's a very Buki, quick question. I've been insisting know? on it. Okay, apart from you, there are like three other persons. So if I let you go, that means we're going to shoot up to 8.30. No, don't worry. Me, I do, my question is a very fast one. It's not anything that has to be a long story. It's something that is to make us think, actually. Okay. Okay, so, so Buki, I would, I, would that, I would ask that you'd answer in like two lines. So once I give to Tibe, I would have to give to Akim Wande and Benga. Okay, so that okay, we okay. So just keep it straight to the point. Okay. Sorry, okay, sorry so for that. Please. After that, Benga. No problem. Okay, um, Buki, please. With the years of experience in this, um, you know, biking apparels I, and all, really I'm trying to see whether there's a possibility. I mean, I wanted to ask, what is the impact of the biking community from Nigeria or maybe at West Africa? on the products we get in the market. Reason I'm asking this, I recently went to Danny's in Paris and all the things I had ordered some years ago, they said they are not having orders from female bikers. So everything that was designed for women is out of the market. The talk boot is out, the chest mm -hmm. protector is out. So I wanted to know whether the um, amount of people placing orders from West Africa is significant enough to impact on brands like Alpine Star and Danny's. That's just my quick question. Okay, um, in two lines. Well, we we were dealing for Denisi, right? And we decided to scale back on Denisi, that's one. Um, initially, when we first started, we were doing um, for both apparels for both male and female. But then suddenly, at the point that we realized that we were, the female gears that we had, some of them we had to eventually give away. So it's just until now that we started basically trying to bring in stuff for women as well. It's just that we don't have that many female bikers on the market to justify the production cost and volumes that a lot of all these manufacturers, um, to justify the investment in female gears by the manufacturers. We don't have enough women yet. That's the truth. You know? And I think it's because maybe when, I mean, for whatever, whatever reason, you know? however, because we are dealers for our fine stars, we work for Denisi, but we step back because we are trying to move on to Revit, Revit. And um, they have quite a number of female gears still in our pine stars for sure, our pine stars and Danisi, but they limit the numbers for female. You understand? And, and it just speaks to the numbers as well here. For, for us here, while we have, we might have like a thousand um, male bikers, maybe we don't have more than maybe 10 or 20 female bikers to a thousand bikers, male bikers. Yeah, so, so that number says a lot. So a lot thank of times- you, Thank you, thank you, Nikki. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Akiwande, please. Over to you and then Benga afterwards. Hi, Akiwande. Thank oh. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll try and make mine brief. Mine is not a question. It's just to acknowledge the importance of uh, 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 the, the, the helmet. So about five years ago, I had an accident and I had I, I, I ran into a truck with head on with my head. I wow. passed out wow. immediately. I woke up at the hospital and it was as if nothing happened to me. But I was just imagining if I had drink any ailments on in that, in that crash, it would have been more devastating. So I think 
And, and I think one of the things, the advice I got when I was getting into biking was that just make sure it is DOT uh, rated or something like that. So I mm -hmm. went to Bookie's place, uh, Metallic, cause again to acknowledge that you do have good products. And I, I, I managed to just get a good one. And I, I was riding with that helmet and thank God I had that uh, a good quality helmet on. So I think mm -hmm. based on my own experience, I would encourage you at least have it, have that good helmet. It can save your life. I mean, I believe that saved my life. If I had a poor, if I had a poor helmet at the time of that crash, perhaps, I mean, I crashed, I, I broke the screen of the, the, the truck I ran into. So it was a very serious, in fact, I broke my leg in the accident. Wow. So it was a serious crash. But wow. today, you, if, I mean, there was no bruise, nothing. My head was protected. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's not just uh, down to the helmet. Perhaps my speed was not also crazy as well, but the helmet did its job. Please. Don't don't that's, don't sacrifice. That's why, having, that's why I'm having a session. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Please don't sacrifice on the helmet at least of all yeah. the gears. Like all right. Thank say, you. That's my um, thank you. Thank you for the testimony, right? Akiwande. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I appreciate what you just said so, right now. Thank yeah, you we'll very much for that testimony. So Benga, go ahead, please. And that's going to be the last question so that we can wrap this up. Thank you. Benga, please unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, that was a nice presentation. Um, and to Buki, uh, this is, I think, uh, I'll patronize you guys more than three, four, five times now, and I can acknowledge Thank you. Uh, the quality. Thank you so much. Though yeah, it's expensive, but, um, you know, I would rather go for quality than, you know, than the price. Um, thank you. So my question is, between high boot and the low boot, I bought the two from you, the RST mm -hmm. I bought. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not so comfortable with the high one, but mm -hmm. I understand that it's better. It protects you more. But in mm -hmm. terms of comfort, it's not as comfortable as you know the short boots. So what will you what will you advise you know for new riders? I'm still new. I'm still like maybe less than two years riding. So. Um, I would say for people that have been riding for 30, 40 years, you know, I'm sure they, they have something to say about that. Sugar, are you there? <laughs> Sugar. <laughs> I, I, I'm purposely calling yeah. someone. Hey, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm actually going to let Sugar answer this question because he's a trainer. And the reason I'm actually calling him to actually answer is because I just don't want it to be that it's just my voice alone that is heard. And, you know, if somebody who puts out new bikers out there every time, if you hear from him generally, he, he would also basically give you a much holistic perspective because he sees students every day. We retail to them. But he probably will be able to talk a bit much more as well. That's why I want him to just share that. Sugar, please. All right, yes. Um, as regards, um, sorry, my voice is a bit funny. I have a flu. Um, as regards the um, high or low boots, um, it's, it will always be high boots for me. You know, it offers the best level of protection. Um, you, when it comes to safety, I, I don't think there's anything more important than, um, you know, having full protection. You know, short boots are pretty much made for convenience, you know, and when it comes to motorcycle riding, you are thinking only safety. I don't think it, motorcycle boots are not for walking around. You understand, you need to understand this. Motorcycle mm -hmm. boots are not for walking around. If you want to wear motorcycle boots in the office, it's your choice. You should carry, you know, extra pair of shoes if you want to be comfortable in the office. Otherwise, it must always be long boots. Now, long boots don't just protect your shin because there's a, there's a space between 
your 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 boots, your short boots, and um, your your shin guard, right? If you wear short boots, there will be a space in between, which you could get you know you could get injuries from there, you know. So you want to always wear long boots, you know, when you ride. There are a couple of comfortable long boots out there, and you know you said you've not been riding for too long. So I'd say it's something whereby you aren't yet used to the long boots. Mm -hmm. You understand? Okay. Like most, like most, most motorcycle gear, you need to break them in. You know, you can't you can't wear long boots one time and say, oh, it's uncomfortable and you don't wear them again. You, they, you never break them in. The same thing happens to your helmet, it happens to your gloves. You know, you don't have a choice. You, you will still wear your gloves, you still wear your helmet. Then just because you have the option of short boots and long boots, then you tend to say, oh, you know what? I'm just going to go for the short boots, you know? Okay. So, um, Mr. Agbenga, I hope that um, answers your question. Yeah, he, he answers. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for thank the you, question Shura. as well. Yeah, thank you, Shura. Thank you, Buki. Um, So I'm going to wrap this up now so that we can prepare for tomorrow's session. Um, I want to say a big thank you to everybody that has been part of today's session. A big thank you to Buki. Um, your wealth of knowledge has been very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, remember this edition and every other safety edition has been brought to you by Bikers in Nigeria in conjunction with BSI, Biker Safety Initiative, and as well, SCAN. Um, tomorrow's edition will kick off by 7 p.m. as well. Um, tomorrow's edition, we'll be talking about DIY, basic motorcycle maintenance you can do for yourself. And our facilitator for tomorrow will be no other person but Photo Daddy himself. Okay. So please, as we said earlier, make sure you reach out to more bikers, tell them about this, and let's have everybody back here tomorrow. 7 p.m. is the time. I would love to have everybody same time tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. The link will be reposted again um, tomorrow like, as a reminder on various forums. So I would ask that once you get it, try to share to your own personal forums and so that we can have more people um, benefit from the session. Thank you very much. Once thank again, you my name very is much Nagy for Mandela. listening. Well, thank you. Yes, the yeah, thank you for having thank you for having us. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.